quality public education for Honduras. So almost all poor kids uh, go to public schools. More and more poor kids are I mean, people who can barely afford it are pulling their kids out of the public schools because they're so bad, which causes a lot of other problems. So people who don't want to be spending their little bit of money they have on a public private school instead of they could be spending something else or spending on, on uh, private education. So here's a few stats that you can see on your computer screen. Uh, Honduras spends 6.9% of its GDP on education. The regional average is 4.2. I just was talking to somebody who works in the, just this morning in the Dominican Republic, and they're fighting to get their average up to 4%. So there you see that uh, Honduras uh, at least as percent of GDP is spending a lot more than its neighbors. Uh, that's somewhat uh, deceiving because Honduras is, is one of the poorest countries in the Americas. So the actual dollar value of how much it spends on each student is still quite low. But it's, it's still an interesting point to make. 13.6 uh, fewer students finish primary school than in the rest of the region. That's awful, right? Uh, since 1997, standardized scores for third graders and sixth graders below 50% are able to pass uh, standardized tests for third graders and sixth graders. Uh, it's about tie with uh, Nicaragua, but it, it's very, very low. Uh, and it's in the whole region of Latin America, it's at the very bottom. So there you see two things. One is Honduras is spending a lot of money, a very poor country is spending a lot of its income on education, but the results are very low. And uh, I think I'll add here, well, I'll wait to that in a second. Days of class, you can also see there, Honduras uh, is averaging around 125 days of classes. Uh, I can give you just a few other numbers. In 2005, Honduras only had 101 days of classes. 2007, it got up to 163. Uh, 2009, the year of the coup, it was less than 100. So in it, it's, it's averaging 125, but over the last few years, there have been several years that it hasn't even gotten to 100. By law, the teachers are supposed to give 200 days of class. So. Uh, again, it shows they're spending a lot of money on education, but kids' scores are not doing well and teachers aren't even teaching. Uh, and there you see uh, at least some of the results. This cycle of poverty continues, so middle class and above put their kids in private schools and get a good education and they have a better future. Poor kids are stuck with their kids in a public school very poor quality education and, and very little opportunity to compete, not only internationally, but even within the country. So where did this all come from? Uh, and as I was putting this together, I mean, you can go to so many different routes. But I think a good piece of it is, is corruption, mismanagement. Uh, probably another word is politicization, the, the politics of education. So uh, both the politicians and the uh, teachers have chosen regularly to resolve the yearly or sometimes more than yearly crises by just uh, putting a band-aid over the issue. So it's in the politicians' interest to sort of settle this quickly and easily because there's 60 some thousand teachers, they're all voters, their whole families are voters, they can shut down the country with strengths. And obviously it's in the teacher's interest to settle it that way too. So that ends up creating a huge opportunity, first of all, for mismanagement of teachers getting paid for things they're not supposed to, of getting bigger raises than the government can really afford, and also corruption on both sides, because both sides are just trying to, uh, yeah, the government's giving things that teachers uh, don't deserve and the teachers in the end know that the government's just sort of not really interested in fixing things. 
So for the last 30 years, there's been at least a strike a year, but it's probably over the last five or six years, there have been several strikes a year. Um, and what it, you know, largely comes down to is pay. Uh, so financial piece is the one that uh, is most often at the heart of issues, but it also is, a, is an issue of power. So every time the teachers go on strike and get what they have been asking for, they, their ability to mobilize the base, their rank and file teachers gets stronger and the government gets more nervous and afraid when they do that again. On the other side, every time the government gives in once, it makes it easier for the next government to give in and more difficult for any government to stick up to them. So it's a power struggle that for the last 15 years or so, the government has been losing regularly. Um, yeah. Let's see if there's anything else I should add on that. Oh, one other thing that's mentioned there on the slide, the Estatuto Docente. So the teachers, it's called the Teacher Statute. It was approved in 1997. And it uh, has a whole list. It's actually a fairly decent law of rights and responsibilities for teachers. So teachers have these list of rights and these list of responsibilities. One of the responsibilities is giving 200 days of classes. So the teachers have been extremely uh, aggressive in defending their rights, uh, in, which is largely a uh, pay scale set up in 1997, which is very generous, and also reinterpreting that pay scale in ways that were most favorable to that. The government has been very weak in enforcing its responsibility, the, government, the teacher's responsibilities. So this Estatuto Docente is a decent law, not great, but it has been uh, managed in a way in which teachers uh, have always uh, come out very well uh, in getting the things like pay raises that what they're supposed to get and more, and not uh, the government has been very poor at holding them accountable to meet their responsibilities. Uh, yeah. So that's a little bit of the background. Uh, here is how where Transformemos Honduras comes in. So Transformemos Honduras is a Christian uh, organization which uh, ASJ helped start, and uh, it's about a little over a year old. And from the very beginning, we have had uh, mostly uh, NGOs here in Honduras, World Vision, Compassion, uh, trying to think of others that they might know. Those are probably the only two that you, you would recognize the name of, but probably about 10 or 12 other smaller a hundred and NGOs, including the SJ. And then the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church have not been real active, but have always been supportive of stuff that we're doing. Oh, Caritas, which some of you would know as a Catholic, kind of the Catholic world vision, um, is also a member. So after the coup, instead of, and the coup is, we Honduras had the coup in 2009, after the coup, Lots of people, and still are just talking about, was the coup right or wrong, and, and what are we going to do about the coup? We decided that we needed to focus on the future and actually changing Honduras. And so that's what this organization has been about. We picked five areas, and one of them is education to focus on. So for the last year or so, we have been uh, learning and working and researching about education and Honduras education problems and trying to be a part of the solution. So a few of the investigations that we did that were mentioned there, one is on teacher hiring. And I'll just describe that quickly, how it's supposed to work in Honduras. If uh, you want to be a teacher, you take a test in your county. And the way the, the Honduran teacher statute says, if you score the highest on that test, you pretty much get to pick, there's a couple little twists in it, but 
you get to pick any job in the county you want. So if you got 100 on the test, you could be in the, you know, the school closest to your house. And it just goes down from there. Um, so uh, besides the test, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing a little thing come up on my screen that says, maybe, I hope you can hear me well. Let me know if you can't. Um, so we did a study. Uh, Okay. Yeah. I'm unmuted. All right. So if the so that's the way it's supposed to work. If you get the highest score, you get to pick where you want to work. So we got about let's see, three years of records. The last three years of all of the teachers who had taken the tests in the whole country. It was about fifteen thousand names. And then we got the names of all the t and their scores. And we also got the names of all the teachers uh, who had been hired in the last three years. And we put those all into Excel, and we had to type them all in, and we crossed the two sets of data. So we could then see if the best scoring teachers got jobs, and we could also see what the scores were of the teachers who actually got hired. And we ended up finding an almost complete mismatch. Almost all of the highest scoring teachers did not get jobs, and almost all of the teachers who did get jobs scored in the middle or lower. So that was very disturbing and surprising, and people always knew that, but no one had ever shown it. Before. After that, then in January, the tests were given uh, here in Honduras for hiring teachers, and we ended up doing a survey we had monitors in, in 16 of the 18 departments, 16 of the 18 counties, watching when the type test was written, when it was applied, when it was scored, and when the scores were put into a database. And now this whole year we're going to be monitoring to make sure, and we've told the commissions in charge of hiring, if you don't hire according to those test scores, you will be held legally responsible. So that's going to be very cool, I think. Uh, we also actually got a copy of a World Bank study that was a little over two years old, in which they had gone around uh, with uh, Honduran authorities and investigated every teacher to see if they were getting, getting paid correctly. So if they were had a master's, were they getting paid for a master's? Or a bachelor's, were they getting paid for a bachelor's? And what they ended up finding was 15,000 of the 60,000 teachers, so 25%, uh, were getting paid more than they were supposed to. And the numbers of that is quite shocking. Uh, from 2003 to 2008, the Hungarian government paid out $47 million, uh, more than it should have. Again, somebody who's got a bachelor's was getting somehow got it worked out so that it was getting paid for a master's. Um, and if the, the payments had continued through when we did the report, lost over $65 million uh, in undeserved pay. So a poor country where education is uh, not doing well, spending $65 million more than it should uh, to pay teachers for things they didn't deserve was, again, a a big uh, problem and a scandal. And in the end, uh, I think it's also quite cool, the Honduran government is now charging those, all of those students, all of those teachers are going to have to pay back the extra pay they got. But of the 15,000 teachers, about 1,000 have already, and I think almost 2,000 have been notified and about 1,000 have already started paying it back, which is the first time I can remember anything like that happened. Uh, yeah, so that that's at least a couple of the studies that we've done that uh, you might be interested in. I'm looking at what it says here on the screen. Yeah, so during, after those studies and sort of throughout, we started meeting with the Minister of Education. He, uh, we probably met with him five or six times, a couple hours each time. We met with the vice president a couple times. And all of that seemed to be going well, but uh, no big changes happening just from uh, 
or work there. Now I'm going to move it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, so what's going on in the last month or so? So the Honduran school year starts in February, the very beginning of February. During February, there were a couple of short strikes, uh, a day or two each, but almost the whole month of March, uh, teachers were on strike. And uh, it was explicitly about teachers' issues. Uh, one of them was they didn't want to have to pay back the money that they had gotten paid, overpaid. Uh, so one of our transformational issues. Uh, the Honduran Congress was considering passing a law that um, was getting parents more involved in supervising schools, so they just didn't like that. And uh, let's see, got a couple other things. Oh, there, there's a big mess in their uh, retirement fund, so they were worried about that. But in the end, what was interesting is it, it became more and more obvious that those weren't even the key issues. Uh, and you can see pictures there of some of the protests. Lots of the protests became much more about anti-government and pro Mel Salaya, who was the president who was kicked out because of the coup. So their slogans, their signs, they were wearing you know things like Che Guevara hats and little uh, berets with hammer and sickles on. And I think that was losing lots of support from the common people because while they may be somewhat sympathetic for teachers making sure they get paid what they're supposed to do, most Hondurans are not at all interested in, in these political issues and probably mostly not uh, in agreement with what the teachers were promoting as uh, a political agenda. So for the very first time in my memory of 25 years here, the government uh, held out, and the teachers ended up going back to work without getting any concessions. So they had four demands, and it ended up developing into five or six. And in the end, uh, they got none of those. The government, the president said, I'm not going to negotiate with you until you're back in the classroom. And after about a month, the teachers finally did. They went back to the classroom. Uh, and I, I'm not exactly even sure why. Uh, I think at least a part of it was the rank and file teachers were no longer, I mean, the numbers of people in the protests were shrinking. Rank and file teachers, I think, were expressing to the leaders that they didn't support this anymore. But the government was also threatening some stuff, like he was, uh, the president was going to uh, lay off teachers who weren't reporting for work. And he actually followed through on that. But presidents have threatened that sort of stuff before and it hasn't mattered. So I think this time it was more that the numbers, instead of thousands and thousands and growing numbers, by the end it was a few hundred teachers here in Tegucigalpa and almost none anywhere else who were still trying to protest. And the government was seeing that their, their numbers were weakening. And I think Hondurans were very sick of this stuff and uh, wanted it to end. So uh, in that scenario, uh, Transformemos Honduras uh, was Carlos Hernandez, and that's the president of Transformemos. You can see a picture of him there. Published a letter asking for, in the past, uh, whenever these things happen, it's the teachers and the union, the teachers and the government, which hold negotiations, usually behind closed doors. And after two or three days, or however long it takes, they come out smiling and shaking hands and signed agreements. And no one's ever very clear, first of all, what happened, but also, and there's often suspicions that the government paid off the teachers, that even the teachers are suspicious that their leaders sold them out. But at the same time, no one is really defending the interests of Honduran children and Honduran education. So we ended up publishing a letter and a full-page ad in three main newspapers in Honduras, 
saying that we thought uh, parents and civil society and children ought to be represented. Uh, honestly, I, I didn't think it would make any difference, <laughs> and I thought we were wasting our money. Uh, but, surprisingly, uh, on Monday we got a couple phone calls that the President had read the letter and really liked it, the President of Congress had read the letter and he really liked it, and Tuesday the President read the letter in a cabinet meeting every Tuesday morning. He has a public cabinet meeting with all of his ministers and he read it there and uh, said that this was a great idea. On Wednesday night we met with the president of the country, the vice president, and a couple of their ministers for about two hours in his office where he again said that he really liked it and he wanted Trump's to be most involved in the negotiation. And Thursday night, uh, you see the picture there, Carlos gave about a half hour presentation about transformables and education in, in the whole Congress, uh, 128 congressmen listening to him talk about education and transformables. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll just add one thing. We also called for a day of prayer and fasting that Sunday before all of this. And I don't think that it's coincidental uh, that we were praying and fasting and that all of this stuff happened, which to me was really unexpected. And uh, I, I think God was working. So uh, last week, so that was two weeks ago that all of that stuff was happening. Last week, on Monday, all the teachers went back to work. And uh, I think it was Wednesday night, right? Wednesday night, the first negotiations were held. And Carlos was there. And you can see him. It's not a good picture of him. Um, uh, Carlos was there and the head of the National Association of Evangelicals and a representative of the Catholic Cardinal was there. So there were three civil society members, both uh, Catholic Church and the Protestant Church are supporters of Transformemos Honduras. So it was three representatives uh, representing Transformemos and civil society. And there were 12 representatives of the teachers, uh, one, two from each of the six unions, and about six representatives from the government. And they, in their first meeting, they had about, uh, I think it was a four-hour meeting just to figure out what the agenda was going to be, uh, which to me sounded crazy, and I probably would have been crazy if I had been there. But uh, Transformemos had one main point. So the teachers have these four or five issues they're still fighting for, uh, their pension fund, that they not have to pay back this money, that they were paid extra, etc. The government has a couple of also important points, but relatively small. One is they want to do a census of all the teachers in the country and make sure they are where they're supposed to be. And another is they want to pass a new law which limits teachers' abilities to go on strike so that they would have to go through a series of steps before they could go on strike, otherwise the strike would automatically be illegal. So those are the sorts of things that the teachers and the government was promoting and what uh, Carlos and uh, Catholic and Protestant Church together said, all of those issues are fine, we will help resolve those, but we want to see basically a complete overhaul of the education system, a national pact, and we want that put on the agenda, and we don't expect it to be negotiated in, in, during this process, but we want to come to an agreement about a process to redo this over the next six months. And all sides agree. The government thought that was a great idea. The teachers thought it was a great idea. And so for about 24 hours, we were all very excited. Oops, there goes my, it's my last one. So what has happened since then is Thursday afternoon, the government uh, finished the process, which it had started two weeks earlier, of suspending about 300 teachers who had been leading the strike. And because they had been on strike for a month, and the government warned them that if they didn't get back to work, they would be suspended. So after two weeks, they didn't go back to work, and the government started the suspension process. Uh, 
I don't know if it's uh, coincidental or not, but the day after the negotiations started, uh, the first 300 names were published, and I guess they have about 5,000 names of more teachers who are in the process of suspension. Uh, so the teachers' unions called off negotiations, and they said that the government was acting in bad faith, and they weren't going to negotiate while the government was taking continuing action. I can kind of see what they were saying. Uh, at the same time, interestingly, that same night, three or four of the unions said that they were ready to go back to negotiation. Two of them said that they wouldn't. So the teachers are also now somewhat divided. So uh, where we are right now is that Wednesday at 5 o'clock, the negotiations are scheduled to restart. It looks like at least four of the teachers' unions and probably all six will go back. I think they have come to decide that they can rework, they can negotiate the suspension better at the table uh, and that either the rank and file nor the citizens want another strike. Uh, but Wednesday is three days before Holy Week and everything shuts down for Holy Week. So I'm not sure how much is going to get done this week. Uh, but negotiations start on Wednesday. Carlos had another several hour meeting with the vice president and a bunch of people on Friday night. And the vice president has asked uh, Transport Mammals, uh, along with the Catholic and Protestant Church, to propose what we think our, the process should be for uh, doing this overhaul of the whole education system. And tomorrow night they want us to present that to them. So they're giving us basically a two days <laughs> to not actually describe what the overhaul would look like, but the process for carrying out this overhaul. So uh, Carlos is, I'm, I'm just excited. Carlos is mostly nervous and worn out. Um, we have gotten, we're trying to get a bunch of other people around us. We're meeting tonight at 6 to work on that. And uh, so that will be tomorrow night with the government presenting our proposal. And Wednesday night, the negotiations start up again. So I think Transformemos, I guess mostly Honduras, is, has a window here where there's a chance to really do something dramatic in the education system. People want it. The teachers uh, are at least feeling I don't want to describe them as vulnerable, but I, I think there's a there's room for dramatic change, and the government also wants it. Uh, the vice president of Honduras, one last little thing I'll drop. The vice president of Honduras for the last 12 years was the head of a foundation which uh, studies education. So even that seems providential. Uh, so I think there's a huge opportunity here. And we would like prayer and all the support you can give us that we will take good advantage of it and uh, get the experts we need, the advice we need, the ideas we need, and that God will lead this process to really change and transform the education system. So I think I'm done there, Jill. And now it's time for questions. So everybody should be unmuted at this point, um, and you could either verbally give questions. Otherwise, there is a you could um, also type in questions, and I will read them aloud if you don't have a microphone. Any questions? Did you hear all the things I just said? Uh, here's a question, Kurt. Uh, does this affect all level of education, including the university level? No. Good question. Um, this, the whole university system is under a whole different set of laws. It's also quite exciting. The national university, which is probably 10 times larger than any 
private universities has a new president, well, not so new, little, by two years now. And she is really doing a good job, I think, uh, and pretty much on her own. Uh, so that is already happening. Uh, it's, I think, also giving people hope that things can change. Uh, the, private, you know, the public university here has been a mess for years, and we've seen all sorts of positive changes there. So it, we would not be touching that at all, but that is already going through some really positive changes. Anybody else? Um, so this is from Jeff. Um, he said he missed a small portion of the presentation, but wanted to know if all the teachers are now back to work. Uh, at least theoretically, yes. So all of the teachers' unions, they had a vote um, last week, Monday, and 16 of the 18 counties or departments all said, uh, said in, in pretty much unanimously that they wanted to go back to work. Uh, two of the departments didn't. Uh, the Tegu's department and uh, another kind of famously rabble rousing one. So that alone was uh, quite surprising to me that all of those teachers voted to go back to work. Uh, just historically, that never ha happens. So all of the teachers have been teaching almost all of last week, and then this week, and then next week is Holy Week. So then there's a week of vacation where I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen after that. And just so everybody knows, if anybody uh, missed a portion of the presentation or came in late, um, this will also, the whole webinar will be posted on our website so you can um, hear it and watch it later as well. Uh, Kurt, here's another question. Um, has the instability in public schools caused growth in the private schools? Yeah, the number of private schools here is skyrocketing. Uh, we live in Nueva Suyapa, a very poor neighborhood. Most of our neighbors are like security guards, women who wash clothes, who are maids. Uh, and I, I cannot believe how many of those people are paying, you know, sometimes 20, 30 percent of their income to have their kids in a private school. Uh, that the instability has been so great that people are willing to sacrifice, you know, most of their disposable income uh, to give their kids hopefully a better chance of education. And a lot of really crappy quality private schools. But at least they have class every day that they're supposed to. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, there's a, another question here. Um, how did the teachers' unions become so powerful? Yeah, it, I mean, I, I think it's just that net, it's a very natural process. It's hard to point to any one moment, right? So first of all, there's 60,000 of them. So it's the largest union. Uh, I, I just, we had a, Transform Amazon Buddhas did a, a forum uh, last week, Monday, and we had five experts, and they knew a lot more about it than I did. They just had lots of interesting stuff that as, as, as late as 15 years ago, Honduran teachers were paid minimum wage, uh, just very low salaries. And anybody who was a teacher, it was just because they really wanted to. Well, that years of that gave the teachers a lot of sympathy in the general public in saying, yes, they deserve to get paid more. And uh, both the teachers and politicians saw that and tapped into that and basically gave them this uh, statute, which included very generous pay raises every year. And so the first few years, that was just fine, you know, because they were finally getting a decent salary. But very quickly, they started to outpace uh, 
even other professionals like nurses and doctors and engineers, which isn't necessarily bad, but if they were giving really good education, it would be great to pay them really well. But when they're only teaching 125 days a year and the kids' test scores aren't going up, but the pay scale keep their pay keeps getting up by 10, 20, sometimes 25 percent a year. It's a problem. So I think it's it's a, a history of underpaid, which then you know the teachers and the politicians played into. 60,000 people who could go on strike. It's a fairly because you know they were successful in their first strikes. It's, I did a little study of social movements and when I was working on my PhD. And the, the best thing a social movement can have is early small successes. And once it's successful a series of times in successively bigger things, the more people want to be a part of it. And the more people will join and get out on the streets. And so they would go on strike and they get a 10% raise. They go on strike and they get a 15% raise. They go on strike and they get a 20% raise. Like, wow, you know, this is great. It's, just keep supporting these teachers until it really got out of control and the strikes became not even about wages anymore and disconnected really to what education needed. And now there's a backlash, I think, in the general public and even among the teachers. A lot of the teachers know that it's uh, no longer uh, appropriate. Can another one there, Jill? Yep. Um, what are the objectives of Transformemos Honduras in the education crisis, and what are the outcomes desired by Transformemos Honduras? Well, interestingly, we had uh, three objectives for Transformemos originally. Um, and if this process continues as it is, we'll probably end up going far beyond what our original objectives are. But I, I think what we're looking at right now, one of, one of the things under is, is education law is, was approved in 1966, and it's largely been unchanged since. So the legislation around education is very updated. Um, so the government and the teachers seem to be in agreement of revamping or reworking the whole education law and all the, the rules and standards which go along with it. So I think legislatively that would be the big piece. I think the other side of it is we would like to see uh, churches, NGOs, parents getting very involved in the education in general, of their of their own kids, but even just you know, even if you don't have kids in the school, uh, so I think the government likes them. Teachers aren't so happy about that. But if we could come out of this process with a, a new structure, which I think largely protects teachers' rights, uh, we're not wanting to punish teachers. But uh, also make sure teachers met their responsibilities as far as schools of improving test scores, etc. And then the third piece that we would actually have a system of making that work, which did not rely on teachers doing it sort of voluntarily or the government doing it when it felt like it, but if we were actually parent teachers associations or parent associations, at churches, et cetera, who are monitoring, making sure that teachers did teach the 200 days and that the quality of education was improving. I think if we can do both of those things, that would be a home run. Anything else? There's another question here, Kurt. Um, it says, this is from Jeff again, I gather education is nationally funded. Would it be better if it were funded by a department? 
uh, I guess uh, this would be like national redistricting. Yeah, uh, I, there's lots of debate about that. Um, and there's a bunch of experts that say that if they broke education down to the municipal level, more like it is in the states with school districts, that would sort of break the power of the teachers' unions and, and you know, make them all negotiate at a local level. Personally, and, and there's smart experts on education who think that's what Honduras needs. Uh, Carlos and I and, and the people in Carlos Bermemos don't. Uh, there's almost 300 municipalities here in Honduras, a lot of them quite small, quite poor. Uh, I, I can't imagine them doing a good job of, of managing and supervising the schools. And it just seems like you would just be uh, more and more uh, condemning very poor rural kids to low quality education, uh, not meeting national standards and stuff. So from at least our perspective, we think it's better to keep the process uh, run at a national level, national pay scales, national standards and and just make those work. Uh, lots of it it's even good on the books, but it's just not implemented, it's not enforced. So uh, you know let's do every year testing of kids and let and that's one of the things they're supposed to do. Let's supervise teachers, let's evaluate teachers. It's something else that's already on the books. But it, it doesn't happen. Um, and get parents and churches and everybody else involved. There's another couple questions here, Kurt. So uh, this is from Andrew. Uh, what are the differences between education in rural and urban Honduras? Yeah, it's a huge difference. So uh, rural and urban, it's usually around 10 points uh, in standardized test scores. Um, a lot of times rural schools have less days of schools even than urban because uh, teachers don't live where they teach, so they live in a nearby city and they commute back and forth. And so they'll go out three or four days, but if their kids are sick or whatever, they'll end up staying in town for a couple days and won't go in to teach. Um, so, yeah. Already poor kids, already disadvantaged, and then they end up, a lot of them are also in one teacher school room, so K through six with one teacher. And you can imagine that. They, they just said there's, uh, it's a five hour class day, but actually four hours of classes. And in those four hours, if you had six grades, the teacher has less than an hour with each grade. And in that less than an hour, they're supposed to cover five topics. So you get about your your third grade math class would get about ten minutes of teacher time a day on that. So you know, really difficult for both the teachers and the kids to do anything to really even learn. Uh, so rural schools, uh, there, there's some really great examples of those schools that are working, but on the whole. Uh, rural schools are at a huge disadvantage. And Kurt, um, what is the yep? Uh, what is the current method of quality control? Next to nothing. Uh, the minister of education told us that there are high schools that even he can't go into, uh, which was shocking to me. He shows up at a high school, and you know, I don't know what they do, but you know, make it impossible for him to go in and visit classrooms and stuff. Uh, so as far as monitoring what people are teaching, I mean, there's principals in the school, but the principals are members of the unions. Uh, the administrative people are usually uh, in place only for a few years, and then you go back to teaching. So you know, it's very difficult for them to come down hard on other teachers when a few years from now, one of that person they're counting down on might be the one supervising them. 
So, uh, yeah, that, that's the, the thing the minister has been talking to us the most is, you know, can transformational help him monitor and evaluate what's going on in the classroom, especially in the high schools. So there's 600 high schools in the whole country, and, you know, he and the vice minister said they're a mess and they don't know where to start. Are there any last questions that people have? Both Jeff and Andrew, thank you, Kurt, for uh, keeping us up to date on the situations in Honduras. Yeah. Thank you all, too, for taking the time to tune in. And feel free to email me or uh, whatever the questions or if you have any ideas. We can use all the ideas that we have. Say a little prayer each day. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.